This is a video in a series of how markets work that'll look at demand, supply, and prices. So this is the first video looking at demand itself. When you think about demand, we're talking about consumers, how much people will demand goods, how much they want to buy goods, and how much money they're willing to spend on it. When we look at demand, we're looking at the, the first thing we need to understand is the law of demand, which is pretty intuitive for most of us, that as prices increase, quantity demanded will decrease. And as consumers, we know that, you know, that makes sense to us. As prices go up, we want to spend less money on it. We're going to, uh, if the price of clothing goes up, we're going to buy less of, uh, you know, like, you know, say it's sneakers, we're going to buy less sneakers because the price has gone up. And that's because, you know, we don't want to spend any more money than we have to because we have other things we want to buy other than sneakers. So as prices increase, quantity demanded decreases. You will demand less of a good. But as prices decrease... If there's a sale, then you might demand more of those goods. So maybe there's an item out there that you wouldn't buy, but when the price is half off, all of a sudden you say, oh, now I'll buy that. Your demand, your, the quantity demanded would increase. If we look at reasons for that, factors impacting the law of demand, we can look at the first one here, the income factor, right? That you have a limited amount of income. So let's say you make $100 a week and you buy coffee every day on the way to school, and that coffee costs you $10 a week, that would leave you with $90 left over to buy other things that you need, like gas and groceries and you know whatever it might be. If your income stays the same, right? so you still make $100, but the price of coffee were to go up to $20, that would now leave you with only $80 left to buy other things like gas and other things that you might need in food. So when you talk about this idea of the income effect, your income, if it doesn't change, right, that means that the higher prices go, right, if coffee costs more money, it's a bigger chunk of your income, and so therefore you're going to be less likely to want to buy coffee as prices change. You feel poor, more poor, when prices go up and your income stays the same. So that's the income effect. We can think of this uh, also with the substitution effect, this other factor that leads into it, substitution effect, that if there's substitutes for a good and prices go up, you're more likely to buy more of the substitute good. So if the price of coffee were to go up, your quantity demanded for coffee might change because you can now go and buy, you might decide to buy tea or make coffee at home or buy an energy drink, whatever it might be. There, Since there's substitutes out there and the price goes up for what you normally buy, you'll quickly shift over to a, a substitute good to buy that instead. The other idea is the idea of Diminishing margin of utility helps explain why demand goes down when prices go up. We think about diminishing marginal utility. What that means is that the more that you consume of a good, the less useful it is, right? So we think of utility means usefulness. It's less useful every time you think marginal, that term means as you increase or decrease by one unit, it diminishes, right? As you consume more of uh, any good, your its usefulness to you diminishes. And an example of that might be if you went for a run and you came back and you were really thirsty and someone was selling water and they were selling it for $5 a bottle of water, you might say, that's worth it to me because I am really thirsty. Water would be very useful at this time. After you drink that bottle of water, you're still fairly thirsty, but not as thirsty as you were before. So if someone were to say, I'll sell you a second bottle of water for $5, you might say, well, it's not as useful to me. My marginal utility has decreased. I won't buy for $5. But if they were to say, well, how about if I sell it to you for three? You say, okay, I'm still fairly thirsty. I will buy that for $3. So the price goes down, all of a sudden, it's more useful to you. You drink it. But if they're, after you've drank that sec, uh, second bottle of water, you don't want any more, or maybe you're just a little bit thirsty, the price would have to drop down to like, you know, a dollar a bottle if you don't want to buy a third bottle of water. So every time, so this is saying as you consume a good, it becomes less useful. Therefore, your demand for it will go down, your quantity demanded. You're going to re require less and less in prices every time you consume it. So we graph this out and talk about this, right? We're going to look at this and say, okay, there's a couple things on here we can put. Uh, we're going to make a demand schedule, or as I like to say, demand schedule. So we have a demand schedule for uh, for any good. For this case, we'll talk about as an example, uh, we'll make this Justin Bieber t-shirts. Justin Bieber t-shirts. So if we're looking at the demand for Justin Bieber t-shirts, if we're going to schedule, make a schedule, schedule will be, we're going to show it in a chart, right? A data chart over here of what our, de, the, 
uh, let's say a region's demand, a market's demand for Justin Bieber t-shirts is. So we could say, uh, let's say we we're going to charge $5 for a Justin Bieber t-shirt. Maybe 100 people would want to buy Justin Bieber t-shirts. And that means, you know, of those 100 people, probably a lot of them could care less about Justin Bieber. Maybe even some of them don't like Justin Bieber at all. Um, but, uh, you know, a $5 t-shirt's a $5 t-shirt. I can wear it inside out. I can wear it to paint or mow the lawn. I can wear it, you know, as a, like pajamas. Nobody has to see me in my Justin Bieber t-shirt. So a lot of people might demand a Justin Bieber t-shirt of $5 because it's so inexpensive. If the price were to go up to $10, some of those people are going to drop out of the market, right? They're going to sense they're not going to want to buy a t-shirt, a Justin Bieber t-shirt for $10, maybe because they really don't like Justin Bieber or because they don't need a t-shirt that much. So, uh, you know, a $5 t-shirt is practically giving it away. Lots of people would want it, but a $10 less, but half those people might walk away from that t-shirt offer. If the price would go up to $15, we'd see another decrease, right? So 20 more people say, well, $15, I'm not, you know, I don't need a t-shirt that bad, so I'm out of the market. And if the price continues to go up to $20, it maybe would be 20 people that still want to buy it. At $25, maybe 10 people. And there's other factors at play we can think about. Maybe some of these people have more money than others. So a $25 t-shirt is nothing to these $10, uh, to these 10 people, where it was, you know, $25 was a big chunk of income to a poorer person. And as the price goes up to $30, only five people would buy it. The people that actually like Justin Bieber, uh, that would uh, say, I want that t-shirt no matter what. So we'd see this decrease, and that shows the law of demand, right, in numbers, right, that as prices go up, we see a decline in the quantity demanded. The quantity demanded goes up, right? So we see that, uh, sorry, quantity demanded goes down. People require less or demand less and less of T-shirts as prices go up. Now, if we're going to graph that, we would say, okay, at $5, uh, uh, 100 people would want to buy a T-shirt at $10. We would have 50 people would want to buy a T-shirt, which is here and at $15 30 people would want to buy a t-shirt and at $20 what did I say 20 people would buy a t-shirt at $10 or sorry $25 10 people would buy a t-shirt and at $30 only five people so we'd have a line that looks something like this right if we connect those dots we have a demand curve this is a demand curve So what this demand curve does, it just gives us a visual for what we already know from this chart. From our demand schedule, we know that as prices go up, less people, less, uh, less people will demand a Justin Bieber t-shirt. And this just puts it into a visual, right? This curve is now showing that, that as price, uh, low prices, lots of people demand it. So we have quantity down here. Uh, I should have said, people pointed that on the axis, right? We always put price on the vertical axis and quantity demanded on the horizontal axis, right? So at $5, lots of people demand it, right? 100 people demand it, but at $30, not many people at all demand it. So we have a visual representation of the law of demand. And this doesn't change. When prices change, this line's going to stay the same. This will be important as we look at uh, a little bit uh, in a second about things that will cause this whole line to move. Prices will never cause this line to move, right? Because if now you think about this line is already marked out and graphed out all the possible quantity demand is at price changes. So at five dollars we're here. If we're gonna say what happens if price goes up, some people might say demand would increase. I'm sorry, if uh, let's say uh, we're here at thirty dollars, right? Only five people demand a t-shirt. If prices go down, more people would demand it. So you, some people might think, well, that whole line would change because demand would change. Well, it's not true because we've already graphed that. If the price went from thirty dollars to ten dollars. We would just follow this line and say, okay, we've already graphed that. We already know that at $10, right over here, 50 people will buy it. So that's already shown on this line. So the, a change in price will never cause this line to change. It just means you're moving from one place on the line to another. This is a term we call ceteris paribus, Latin for basically all things being constant. Ceteris paribus. So if nothing else changes other than price, this line doesn't move because we've already graphed out all the possibilities of prices. And there's prices on here we didn't mention, right? So like think about this line that would say that if it was $7 and our price might, our quantity demanded might be around here if it was at roughly $7. And if it was at $17, our quantity demanded would be roughly right around here. So all of this, this graph shows all these different possibilities. So unless something else changes, if there's the only thing that changes is price, Ceteris paribus exists and the line doesn't move. And that could be confusing because now we're going to look at things that could cause this line to move. So 
we're going to look at, for instance, uh, so we're going to call these, first of all, shifters of demand, right? Things that can cause demand to change, a whole graph to shift to the right or to the left. Shifters of demand. So uh, that would mean that ceteris paribus is no longer in play because something else has changed. So one example, one thing that can cause demand to change would be income. So we think about income and we're looking to graph the demand of new cars here, right? So if we put, I won't do a demand sed, uh, schedule here, but we'll just say that, you know, roughly that, say if five, this is in thousands of dollars, by the way, if you look at price over here, we're talking about in thousands of dollars. So if price for cars were $5,000 over here, what would that demand be? So let's say, you know, make up a number here. It'd be roughly 900 people would want to buy a car at $5,000 because that's a really cheap price. So people that didn't even think they needed a car might say, oh, I'll get a car anyway, a new car for $5,000 because that's a great deal. And you'd have all these different prices, different quantities demanded along the way. At $10,000, maybe it goes down to $600. At $15,000, maybe it goes down to $400. At $20,000, uh, somewhere around there, I think I missed a line, but $25,000, maybe it's at uh, $300. And at thirty thousand dollars, it's there, and at thirty-five thousand dollars, it's there. So we see this line similar to before, a downward shifting to the right line that shows a visual representation that, as prices are low, quantity is high, right? So we have this, and if prices are high, quantity is low. So we're down here in the low parts. So if nothing were to change other than price, that would be ceteris paribus. This line would stay the same we've already grafted. So the question is, what could cause this line to change? So if we're looking at income, if we were to graph this out in a year from now, everybody's income had increased, this whole line may have changed. So if we talked about it, say an increase of income, All these different spots might change. So I'm going to draw a, uh, a new graph here. So we'll call this demand. We'll label it D. We'll label it D1 because we're going to show a change in demand. So if all of a sudden people's income were to increase, we had here about 9,000 people, uh, sorry, 900 people had demanded a car $5,000. That might go up to something we'd have a chart. Maybe it's like 1,500 people now would demand a car $500, $5,000 because their income's gone up. If they go back to the income effect, if I have more money, if I make $10,000 more this year than I did last year, now all of a sudden buying a car is easier for me to do because I have more money. And all these different lines would change. At $10,000, maybe this many people would want to buy it. And at $15,000, maybe this many people. So we see all these different lines change. At $35,000, not that many people wanted to buy it before, right? So at $35,000, we, you know, this shows about 150 people. But because their income has gone up, more people would want to buy a $35,000 car. So all these dots in a line would change. They'd shift to the right. They'd move to the right because income has increased. And we will label this demand too. It shows a rightward shift of the demand curve because people's income has gone up. So this is no longer ceteris paribus, something other than prices change. So we know that if people's income has gone up, demand in a market's going to increase at all these different line points, right? We're going to have a new demand curve shifting to the right, showing that at all these different prices, more people would demand it. And the inverse of this would be true, too, that if we think about, if we erase this new demand line, if all of a sudden income were to decrease, so we had a decrease in income, then all these dots might change. So if all of a sudden people, there was hard times, unemployment, whatever it might be, less people, we saw here that uh, at $5,000, 900 people demanded a car, but now maybe because income has gone down, it might only be 600 people demand a car at $5,000 because they have to save money for utilities and food and things like that. And all these different lines would change if there was a decrease in income, meaning our demand curve would shift to the left, right? So a decrease in demand always shifts to the left and an increase in demand always shifts to the right. So income can cause things to change. And there's a distinction we'll make here for what we call, these are, uh, say a new car would be something we would call a normal good. So for normal goods, things people would buy when their income increases, or they buy more when their income increases, are called normal goods. We also have something called inferior goods which would be different, and this can be kind of confusing. Inferior goods. Inferior goods are things that are like name brand foods or things that you would buy as an alternative if your income was down. So a, a inferior good in this case would be a used car. 
So imagine that if we we're going to go back to the idea that income is, we have an increase in income. All these people are making more money because of what the economy is good or whatever. So we have an increased income. Then, and we're going to no longer uh, graph new cars. We're going to graph used cars. The demand for used cars might actually go down. And the reason for that would be in, would be because if people were making more money, they would say, well, I'm not going to buy a used car. I, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm not going to buy a used car. I would rather buy a new car since I have more money in my pocket. So sometimes when you have an increase in income, the demand for inferior goods like used cars could go down. So before that, uh, if this was, let's imagine this was a graph for used cars, less people at uh, $5,000 might demand it. So their demand might go down to somewhere around here. So we graph that, you know, their demand might go down here because instead of buying a used car and their income has gone up, they would buy a new car. They'd rather have a new car than a used car. So we might see the demand for inferior goods get down. Another way to think about this, another good that uh, helps illustrate that, if that doesn't seem uh, too clear, would be uh, generic food products, right? Like we like to buy in our household, we like Dr. Pepper. So Dr. Pepper is a normal good. Pepper, this is a normal good. Right, the name brand product goes for usually about, uh, I think like $5 a 12 pack. But when times are hard or I don't feel I have a lot of money or around Christmas when I'm you know, racking up the credit card debt, I will buy the inferior good Dr. Perky, which is the store brand version of Dr. Pepper. To me, it tastes exactly the same, but people make fun of it when we buy it. So I buy Dr. Perky because it's about half the price of Dr. Pepper, inferior good. So when times are... When times are hard, right, around Christmas time when I'm spending money on other things and I'm racking up credit card debt, if we're going to say, if we're going to graph Dr. Perky here, right around Christmas, I would spend more money on this inferior good because my income, in a sense, has gone down because I'm spending more money on other things. So that would cause that line to shift to the right for Dr. Perky around Christmas. But maybe uh, other times or if I got a raise, I'd say, well, I'm not going to buy Dr. Perky because I have more income. My income has gone up. So therefore, I'll buy Dr. Pepper and my demand for Dr. Perky would shift to the left because it's an inferior good. Other things that can change, uh, you can think about some other stuff, population, right? So population changes can cause a shift in demand. So if we were going to uh, put up here, this would be, uh, say, for khaki pants in a market. So in whatever, you know, this region of the country, they, you know, the seacoast of New Hampshire, people buy khaki pants. So the, maybe there's a demand for khaki pants that looks something like this. So we won't do all the numbers. So this would be our demand for khaki pants. And if the more people moved into the area, there'd be more people that want to buy khaki pants at all these different prices. At $10 before, this is how many people wanted to buy khaki pants. But now since there's more people here, there's naturally living here, there's naturally going to be more people. So maybe there's 40 people now that buy khaki pants at $10 simply because there's more people living in an area. And that would change for all these other price points. So our demand line would shift to the right. We'd have a new demand demand to, this whole thing would change, right? So uh, if there was no change, then this line would stay the same. They'd be setters paribus. But since there's been a population increase, there's more people living here. There's naturally going to be more people demanding goods at all these different prices along the line. So these would all shift to the right. So we'd have a new demand curve. And the inverse would be true too, that if there was less people living here, people left the region, they migrated somewhere else, there'd be less people available to buy the khaki pants, and that whole line then would shift to the left. So we'd add all these different price points, there'd be less people buying khaki pants just because there's simply less people here. So that can cause the whole line to shift. A third shift of demand would be demographics. So we're thinking about demographics and looking at, say, uh, video games, PlayStation games or Xbox games, whatever it might be. How many people are going to buy video games in a particular market? So let's say we're still talking about the seacoast of New Hampshire. So if we we're going to graph video game demand, and it looks something like this again. All right, we don't have numbers in here, but at low prices, this is our prices at low prices. We have high quantity, and at high prices, we have low quantity, right? So our graph still shows that. If there was a demographic change, for this case, let's imagine that the population of the seacoast got more uh, old, they got more elderly, young people were leaving the region, older people probably play less video games. So we'd say if our population got older, we had a demographic shift in age, then, uh, then this whole line might shift, right? There'd be less people buying games at all these different lines because there's less people of that age who play video games. So there might be people you know, uh, uh, only this amount of quantity buying it at this price because 
younger people of left in us older types don't like those newfangled video games. Uh, and the inverse will be true too, that if younger people moved in, there'd be more people buying it. So demographics can change. And demographics can be, uh, can be age, can be ethnicity, it can be gender. All those things might cause a change in how much people demand some goods. So that could cause a shift in this whole line. If we look at consumer tastes, there's another thing that can shift uh, goods. Some of that could be, uh, say you think about advertisements, can cause a shift. So if we're going to look at, uh, you know, say, um, uh, you know, an ad for, let's say this is talking about the demand for, uh, say, Dunkin' Donuts would be one, right? Dunkin' Donuts. You see ads all the time. They remind you of Dunkin' Donuts. They have Dunkin' Donuts on the run. They have people like David Ortiz doing ads, and everyone loves David Ortiz. So if we had our demand for Dunkin' Donuts on this line, um, showing that a lot of people, again, will buy Dunkin' Donuts at low prices and less people buy them at high prices. But if all of a sudden there's this ad campaign that's really popular and people see David Ortiz drinking Dunkin' Donuts and they say, well, if I drink Dunkin' Donuts, I will be as cool as David Ortiz, there may be this huge increase in demand. At all these different prices, more people are going to want to buy Dunkin' Donuts because of an effective ad campaign. Um, this could also be uh, co uh, consumer taste could cause a decrease in demand. So if we think about a different good, such as, let's say, hoverboards. Now, I don't know if they've solved this problem, but I remember when hoverboards first came out, the batteries had a tendency to catch on fire and explode, which can make it less fun to ride a hoverboard when you could catch fire on it. So if you had to think a consumer taste could go down, right? People could say, oh, this, is, this is what people were consuming, or this is how much um, how many hoverboards people were demanding initially when they first came out, but now that there's news reports of them exploding and people catching on fire at all these different prices, people say, oh, I have less demand for a hoverboard. I don't want one as much as I did before. This new line could shift to the left, showing a decrease in demand. So consumer taste can cause that. That could be health reports about food. It could be... Uh, you know, if you uh, used to, uh, you know, if there was a celebrity that you don't like, it could cause a decrease. A celebrity that you do like could cause an increase. Or if there's a health report saying, like, something's more healthy for you, that could cause a, an increase in this line. So if we were talking about some kind of food, like, uh, uh, like you know, vegan products or something like that, people, there may be an increase in demand for vegan products because consumer tastes have gone up because there's a report that they're more healthy. Granted, they taste terrible, but, um, but they're more healthy. More people might want to... Um, uh, to consume them. We think about uh, price of related goods is another thing that could cause a shift in this entire line. So if we're going to put, say, uh, another fictional demand curve up here, let's say this demand curve is for, let's say, uh, donuts. So this is how much people would demand donuts. Now, if there's a price change in donuts, this line wouldn't move. Ceteris paribus would be in place, right? So we'd say if the price were this amount of money for donuts, this many people would consume it. And if the price were to change, go up to this, this many people would consume donuts. So the that's already graphed on here. That's ceteris paribus. However, if you had a, uh, we think of related goods, we have some goods called complements. So if the price of, let's say, coffee were to decrease, so all of a sudden, uh, you usually coffee and donuts go together. So a lot of times people buy them together. And if all of a sudden coffee were half off, maybe before I wouldn't buy a donut, but I'm like, oh, well, coffee's half off. I have more, you know, I used to spend $3 on a coffee and a donut. Maybe now I'll buy two donuts because coffee is half off. That could cause this demand for donuts to go up. So you can think about a change in price of coffee so the, this would be your morning coffee. If a change in price of coffee were to go up, I mean go down, that could cause an increase in the demand for donuts. So this is our demand for donuts could go up. So it's important again to think about that uh, the price of donuts changing would not cause a shift in the line of the demand for donuts. This can be can kind of confusing, right? That would just be a change in quantity demanded. So that's our distinction here, quantity demanded versus just an increase in demand. So when we're talking about quantity demanded, we've already graphed all of that out on this line that the price of donuts is not going to change this line, but the price of a complement like coffee may make everyone say, well, I used to demand this many donuts at, you know, $2 a donut, 
but now I'll demand this many donuts at $2 a donut because I'm spending less money on coffee, which they usually go together. That whole line for donuts could go up. You can think about this being the same as, uh, you know, like say like ski boots. If you're, if you, uh, you don't know if you want to buy new skis because you don't want to invest in new skis, um, but you kind of need them, so you're debating that. And if all of a sudden the price of ski boots were to drop, well, I usually, if I'm going to buy new skis, maybe I'm going to buy new ski boots too. If ski boots were to drop the price of that, then maybe I would buy more skis. My demand for skis would increase because the price of something that goes with it, ski boots, has decreased. So we don't have a change in the price of skis, but in the price of a, uh, of a complement. This could be also true of what we call substitute goods. So there's complements and there's substitutes. And we talked about this a little bit at the beginning. If we're going to go back to our example of coffee, if uh, we're talking about, co if this is showing demand for coffee, and we think of a substitute for coffee, which might be energy drinks. or maybe even tea, something like that, another caffeinated beverage. So my demand for coffee is this, but all of a sudden there's a, a drop in the price, not a drop in the price of coffee, but a drop in the price of one of these sub substitute goods. I might say, well, I'm gonna demand less coffee because tea has become less expensive. So all these different points on this line might change. I might say, well, you know, I used to demand this much on a, uh, coffee at a certain price, but now I'm going to demand this much coffee because I can shift over and get the much cheaper tea or energy drink. So all these different lines, these spots might change, and our demand for coffee may shift to the left, showing a decrease in demand because of a substitute good. And uh, a couple other ones. Last one that really changed it, it would cause a shift, and this would be future expectation of prices. So you can think about a couple things. Uh, if we're going to have uh, things that could cause a change in demand. So we'll draw our demand line. Let's say this demand line is for TVs. And this is how many TVs people would buy, whatever it might be, 50 inch TVs, whatever. This is how many TVs people buy at this low price down here. A lot of people buy it. This is how many people buy a TV at this high price. Not many people would buy it. So we think about uh, future expectations. We could think about there may be a holiday sale coming up. So we expect around Thanksgiving with Black Friday shopping, there's going to be holiday sales, or the cheapest time to buy a TV is right after the Super Bowl for various reasons. A lot of people will go out and buy a TV, watch a Super Bowl, and then return it. So you can go get a great deal on an open box TV. So whatever it might be, if you anticipate in the future that because of a sale or something like that, that this would cause prices to drop in the future, buying TVs next month will be cheaper than buying TVs today that could cause this whole line to shift to the left, right? We'd have a decrease in demand today for TVs if we expected that tomorrow or next month TVs would be cheaper. Why buy it more for more today when I can expect reasonably that I could buy it for less in a month? So that could cause demand for TVs today to, uh, to drop down incredibly. So that could cause a, that, and that wouldn't be the change in the price of TVs today, right? So that's the ceteris paribus. That's the, not a price change for TVs today, but if a price change in the future would cause, uh, could cause a drop in demand. Another example that might cause an increase uh, in demand for expectations would be, if we say we're buying bathing suits and we're gonna buy them in the, uh, in the winter, so let's say it's January or February, say, well, if I wait till the warmer months around April or May, they're probably going to raise the prices of bathing suits because they know more people are gonna need to buy them for uh, you know, the summer. So if I expect bathing suit prices to go up, in the spring, I would buy more bathing suits today. So if this was talk about bathing suits, this is our demand for bathing suits, and now we expect prices to go up, all this demand curve may increase, right? More people would say, I'll buy more. I used to buy this many bathing suits. Well, I don't have that price on it. Let's say I used to buy this many bathing suits. This is how, many, how much I'd be willing to spend, how much quantity I would demand. But now because I expect prices to go up in the future, the quantity is going to go up at the same price. I might people or say a whole market might buy more bathing suits because they're expecting a change in prices in the future. So the demand could go up now. It could be see an increase in demand. It would just be demand too. So all of these things, these categories, could cause a shift in demand, right? So the whole line would move for any of these things. Uh, the last thing we can talk about with demand would be elasticity of demand. And we know that elasticity of demand basically means how consumers react to price changes.
to price changes. So when prices go up, does demand drop incredibly on that demand curve or does it drop not at all? And some factors that could impact how much consumers react to price changes will depend on goods and how we classify them. So we think about things like, um, this gives us the example here, the availability of substitutes, which we've talked about a couple of times. If there are a lot of substitutes available for a good, that means that um, the demand for that good may be what we call more elastic. So if we think about something like if we're gonna graph over here, um, let's say this is the demand for beef products. There's a lot of alternatives to beef products like chicken, pork, or uh, even vegan products and things like that. So you may say, I like a beef, but when price of beef goes up, then uh, my chain, my demand's gonna change incredibly. So we think about, uh, can we have down here, let's uh, label, we got quantity on this axis, we have price on this axis. So uh, when uh, you can say that when price is low, over here, we might have a lot of people buying beef. So we're going to briefly graph that. We have a lot of people buying it, and we know that when price is high up here, less people are going to want to demand it. So we would have uh, a dot up here. And we would say that if, uh, we're, if the price of beef were to go up, there'd be a great change in quantity demanded. So you think about how we could look at that, right? So if price went from here to here, if it changed very, if it changed uh, very little, then we would see like a line, you know, the demand would be pretty close to the same dot, but we're gonna see a big change in quantity demanded because people could say, well, if price of beef goes up, I will buy chicken. So we might see this line and maybe we go down to here, right? So we go from uh, whatever this might be, uh, maybe we could dot that out and figure out what numbers we got. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Nine. So this is 900 people would buy beef. Let's say if the price of beef were to go up even a little amount from, say, a dollar a pound to $2 a pound, then we would see a great change in the price of beef. So maybe we would go down to something like 500 people would buy beef. So we'd have a shallow line here, right? It would be a very shallow line showing elasticity. And if the price were to go up to $3, then we would have probably another change that might uh, be even bigger. So maybe that will go down to over here. So we still have a very shallow line. And then sometimes you see that curve might go up, right? I, I do that line with probably way too high. This is probably extreme, right? But you might have other people say, well, you know, I need to eat my hamburgers. And, uh, you know, even if the price goes up a little bit higher, I'm still gonna buy some beef, but not a lot. So then this line might start going a little bit further up. So it might be something like that, right? But either way, if you have a shallow line, this shows elasticity because there's a substitute good, right? This is uh, shallow equals elastic. Your consumer demand is going to change significantly as price goes up from one spot to another. There's gonna be a big change in quantity demanded as price changes, right? Because there's a substitute for beef, there's chicken, pork, and other things. If there are no substitutes, or very few substitutes, for you might think of in the food line milk, there's not a lot of substitutes. I mean, there's almond milk and things like that, but some people can't drink that because they're allergic to almonds. So you might say, if we're gonna graph that out and look at these substitutes for milk, so let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we have 900 people demanding milk and then we get to put the prices over here. One, two, three, four, these are per gallon. We might see a much different line here or a little bit different line. So you might say at $1 a gallon of milk, 900 people are gonna buy it because they need milk to bake and eat cereal and for if they have babies drinking milk. Uh, and if the price were to go up to $200, it might not even drop 100 people, it might only drop you know, a slight sliver of amount of people might still, uh, might change the demand for milk. And then if it went up to $3, it would still similarly be very few people and $4 and $5. We'd have a very steep line for something uh, like milk because there's not really an, uh, a whole lot of substitutes for it. So it should be, uh, we could say a steep curve. Steep curve equals inelastic, there will not be a lot of change in quantity as prices go up. And you can kind of see that here, that uh, at $1, here's our price, and at $2, our quantity has barely changed at all. It's not even that much, right? Our quantities change a sliver. And as the price goes up, it changes a sliver, right? There's not a lot of change in quantity demanded as price goes up because there's not a lot of available substitutes for milk. So um, substitutes can affect elasticity. Another thing that can affect elasticity would be relative importance to budget. So if you were to figure that, uh, if uh, we looked at a couple different things, let's call this uh, internet. 
uh, maybe even slash cable bill, right? Because a, a lot of times those things are uh, are bundled bundled together, right? So if you think that uh, if uh, cable costs a lot of money, uh, you know, say a hundred and you know, eighty dollars a month, something like that. Internet and cable, your bundle from Comcast or whatever, uh, whoever uh, provides that, then uh, you might say that at uh, a high or at a low price, a lot of people will get internet and cable if it was really cheap. But if the price of cable there go up, let's say this is like it, they had a deal is like hundred dollars a month for internet and cable, a lot of people would demand it. But the price were to go up to something like, um, uh, um, you know, two hundred dollars a month or something like that, then you know that the demand would go down. And as the price went up, demand would go down even more. So we'd have a line showing that less people would demand cable at higher prices. They'd find alternative streaming services. I mean, it's tough with internet. That's kind of a necessity, right? But they, you know, maybe they'll use their, their, their data plan instead, right? But we'd have a change in demand for that. Uh, and you think about this is a huge, not huge, but this is a big portion of someone's budget. So we're talking about the relative importance of budget in this case, right? So how much money do you spend? So you think about cable, if that costs, let's say, you know, $180 a month for cable, that's a big portion of the amount of money you make. If we we're going to compare that to something like soda, right? So let's say for soda, even if you drink it every day, you're spending maybe, you know, like, I don't know, $20 a month on soda, then that might not cause a, uh, much of an increase or a decrease in your, uh, um, in your consumption. So actually this line would, uh, I didn't really take the time to graph it out, but there might be a bigger change, right? So you might have a more of a shallow change for internet cable. You might say, look, that's a big portion of my budget. So if my, if cable costs $180 and then it goes up to $250, that's a huge portion of my budget. You see a big change in all these different lines here, right? So I didn't graph it well the first time, but you see a big change in quantity demanded. This would be in elastic demand because there's a big portion of your budget. But if you think about soda, if you spend $20 a month uh, on soda and then uh, all of a sudden the price were to go up to, you know, I don't know, uh, like $25, whatever it might be, you'd see more of a steep demand because people might say, well, look, uh, at a... Uh, uh, if we're going to say I buy this much soda at a cheaper price, and if the price were to go up, you know, 50 cents a 12-pack, uh, I'd still buy a lot of soda because I love soda. 50 cents isn't that big of a deal because, you know, I don't spend that much of it per month. And if the price were to go up incrementally, we'd see more of a steep line. So our, our, this would be more of an inelastic demand because we don't spend a lot of money on it to start with. You know, and maybe soda, it depends on how much you uh, where you spend on it, there'd be more portion of your budget, but if it was something like shoelaces, how often do you buy shoelaces? So if you wanted to buy shoelaces, man, that might, that might be a better example than soda. So think about that, right? If we were talking about shoelaces, how often do you have to buy replacement laces for your shoes? However, you know, very seldom. So shoelaces were to change from, you know, like, a, you know, $1 for shoelaces, you'd buy this much. And if the shoelace price were to go up to $5 for shoelaces, you probably still have to buy shoelaces because you need shoelaces and you don't buy them that often, you know, once every few years. So you, this would be a very inelastic demand. Um, the last thing for elasticity, you might think of necessities versus luxuries. So we're thinking about something that's necessary. We think about gas, right? We need to buy gasoline. So if the price for gasoline were to be $1 a gallon, we would buy this much gas. So we dot it there. If the price of gas were to go up to, say, $2, we'd still have to buy gas. We have to get to work. So the demand might go there. There might be a few people that drop off from buying gas. Uh, there might be a small decrease in de quantity demanded, but the price change isn't going to change it drastically because we need to buy gas to get to where we're going. So, uh, and then if the price were to go up to $3, that would still change a little bit, but not a lot. And, you know, maybe if we went up to like, you know, like $4 doesn't change a lot, but if we were to get to like start getting to $5, we might see more of a decrease in demand because people then would say, well, I'll carpool or whatever. But you think about in this first part of this graph, it's a very inelastic demand curve because it's, first of all, it's steep, right? It shows that there's not a lot of change in the de quantity demanded as prices go up and people need to buy gas. Another way you could think about this, another item that would be even more elastic, inelastic, I should say, would be, say, medicine. Say this was for insulin. People that need insulin can't really choose not to take insulin. This would be sometimes people might call this would be what they call perfectly inelastic. It almost might be a, an exactly steep line. And it's possible, I suppose, that maybe this wouldn't be perfectly steep. But think about even if this wasn't going straight up and down, if it was, it'd be something like this, right? Because if you need insulin, 
to, as a life-saving medicine and you demand this much at a low price, it's not going to change a whole lot when price goes up because you still need it. You're going to have to find a way to get that insulin because you need it to survive. Or, you know, I might think of it as being like a, you know, like a blood pressure medicine or any kind of life-saving medicine. Your demand is going to be inelastic because it doesn't matter how much price goes up. You need it. So it'll be inelastic demand. Then you think about things that aren't necess necessities like chocolate. You love chocolate, but you can't spend tons of money on it. So if the price were really low down here, you would buy this much chocolate. But if price were to go up to, say, you know, say this is a dollar for a chocolate bar and it would go up to $2, a lot of people say, well, I don't need chocolate that much. And if it would go up to $3, less people would buy chocolate. So maybe it's here. And at $4, you know, then, then maybe it would start steeping up because the desperate chocolate lovers would still buy it. But you would see a very shallow line for chocolate because it's not a necessity. It's a luxury. We, nobody needs chocolate, but we just like to have it. So when prices go up, the demand drops uh, significantly. All right, so that ends our, uh, this, uh, this video on demand. The next video will be looking at supply.